Welcome, everyone. We're going to get started in just a few seconds as people enter the webinar room. Well, hello. I'm Tom Cadigan, Associate Director of Alumni Relations and a proud member of the Holy Cross Class of 2002. And wherever you may be zooming in from this afternoon, I want to welcome you to today's alumni and parent webinar event brought to you by the Holy Cross Club of Greater Boston. Now, today's topic resonates for many of us, home buying. Um, a popular topic based on the number of registrants for our conversation today. Now, some housekeeping notes before I introduce today's wonderful presenter. We'll be together for just about an hour. Allie will start with some prepared remarks, and then we'll take questions from you for as long as time allows. Now, I encourage you to submit questions throughout the webinar using the Q&A function located on your toolbar. Now keep them coming. I'll return later to facilitate your questions. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our terrific presenter, Allie Dudley-Joyce, class of 2010, an experienced Boston professional and a long-standing volunteer with the Holy Cross Club of Greater Boston. She currently serves as the club's scholarship chairperson. Now, Allie is a realtor for William Ravis Real Estate, Mortgage and Insurance, and has led many seminars and webinars like this for Holy Cross alumni, parents, and friends, always to rave reviews. And we are so grateful for her involvement today. Allie, welcome. Thank you so much, Tom. I really know how to make a girl blush. Um, okay, so welcome everyone. I'm so excited to be here. Before we get started, I want to just get a feel for the audience, see if we can make this a little interactive, even though it's virtual. So Tom is going to present a few different poll questions up on the screen. So first off, which of the following best describes your circumstances? Are you a first time home buyer? Are you upsizing, meaning you're selling your current place and buying a larger place? Or are you downsizing, being the opposite? You paid your last Holy Cross tuition. Um, or are you transitioning from the city to the suburbs? So that's question one. Question two is how are you feeling about the market today? Are you confident? You've seen a lot of market cycles. You don't know how to feel because you don't know what you don't know. That's a line I stole from um, a Jesuit at Holy Cross. I remember he was talking about uh, freshmen in, in a sermon and he said, freshmen don't know what they don't know. So in, is, is this applied to you in home buying? Is it abject horror? What is going on? Are we in a bubble? Um, or is it somewhere in the middle? You lucky even keeled people. Um, and then the final question, which is open-ended and you can use your chat to respond, is when is the best time to buy? So no wrong answers. I'll share with you the advice that was given to me by a uh, real estate investor way back when I started. And take with it, take with it what you will. Okay, so as Tom is sharing those questions. All right, Allie, can you see? These are the oh, results yes. the first, yeah. Okay, great. That's wonderful. Lots of first time home buyers. Welcome everyone. What a, it's a great way to empower yourself. And I see we have equal parts upsizing and downsizing. So, um, and transitioning from the city to the suburbs. That's wonderful. So upsizing the chicken or the egg, right? Do we buy first or do we sell first? That's the big question. Right. And now we're launching the second part. question number two. Okay. Here we go. We'll give people a few seconds to put in. Okay. That response. sounds good. While you guys are answering, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. As Tom mentioned, I went to Holy Cross, graduated in 2010. I was a psychology major. Um, so it just shows that liberal arts education can apply to anything. To the disappointment of my 
fine of my advisor, Professor Futterman. I don't know if anyone had the pleasure of being Professor Futterman's student. I did not get my PhD in psychology. I actually went into financial sales. And then I used that experience and I went into real estate where my real passion is and I haven't looked back. So do about 40 to 50 transactions a year. I'm an active participant in Boston, greater Boston and the suburbs. And the reason I bring this up is just so you know that I'm actively involved. I've learned a few things along the way and I'm gonna use that information to empower you today. So um, the result. let's see, let's see the next one. Okay, no one is confident, <laughs> oh no. All right, so we will change that. A lot of people, you don't know what you don't know. And a few abject horror. Oh no, don't worry. We're going to help you with all of that. Thanks for having a little fun with these questions, guys. Wonderful. Okay. So let's talk about what we're going to talk about. The agenda is short and sweet. Um, we're just going to talk about a few things here uh, market trends, the buying process, and how to set you up for success. So there's no more abject horror. <laughs> All right, let's talk about the market. So are we in a bubble? All my abject horror people, it does seem pretty scary out there, but don't worry, you will find a place. You just have to have conviction in what you're doing and a process that you stick to. But let's talk about the market. So um, what we do when someone asks me, are we in a bubble? I look at past trends and see, are there any correlations? The last real estate market bubble was in 2005 and 2006. And what we were seeing were very, very loose financing requirements. You were able to get a loan based on stated income, meaning I could have no job and just tell the loan officer, the bank, whomever, that I'm, I make a million dollars. And they use that income in order to underwrite my loan. It's far from being allowed now. They also were allowing quite a bit of leverage. So one of the benefits of owning a home, all my downsizers and upsizers who already own know this, um, is that you can take out a home equity line and you can use that to, as for a large purchase, to do a large renovation, or you can use it as a credit card. It's just a tool for you to take advantage of the equity in your home. Now in 2005 and 2006, you were able to, you were able to get a loan for 125% of this equity. Now you're only allowed to get a loan for 70 to 80%. So we're in a much different lending environment and the money that is going around is not as loose as it was previously. So that's helping us think that maybe this really isn't a bubble. What seems to be the case is that we're really in a low inventory, high demand, high demand market, and it's simply the supply and the demand that is driving it. So if you see the chart on the left, that is our inventory. And you see that in 2019, there was a little bit of a spike. The market was starting to change. And then COVID happened and inventory dropped steadily. The graph on the right, that is the steady incline. Hopefully you're seeing it in the same orientation as me. That is the steady incline. That's our prices. That's average price. And it is correlated to the demand. So really it's as simple as supply and demand. And that is what is driving these really high prices. Interest rates are low, um, but they are rising. They're not as low as they were. They still are very low. Um, for my downsizers who bought maybe a few decades ago, it's probably um, a very different rate experience environment. Um, so that's a good sign that the feds are not keeping rates to that is almost zero number, which as for interest rates is really in those twos. They are not high enough. I know we got this question. I hate to say it, but they're not high enough to change prices. We really need to see a multiple point increase to the four, five, six range for that to impact prices. Um, we're in a rising market, which means that the data is actually behind the market. So in real estate, the data is on about a 30 to 60 day lag. Now, typically there's not that much change in prices in that time period. Right now, there's actually a stark difference in those prices. So a property might've sold for 550, and now a similar property is on the market and that's going for 600. So 
it's challenging to navigate, but as long as you have someone who is an active participant providing you with the information of what we know and what we, um, what we know based on the data, and then also what we know based on being a participant in the market, you are able to make a decision as to what's best for you. So that's what's going on in the market right now. Um, before I begin, Tom, did anyone answer our third question? about um, when is the best time to buy? No, the chat's oh, been no. quiet. It's, we have some shy people out there. All right, well, Tom, do you wanna give it a go? I'll put you on the spot. <laughs> when is the best time to buy? Yes, no wrong answer. I guess when, when you're ready, when you have some cash in hand, Wow, that's actually, that's basically what the investor told me. I see. Yeah, not bad for a history. You're good. Wow. And I didn't even prep you in our practice. No, no. Um, that was awesome. So um, I always, you know, you always think, right, low interest rates, buyer's market. And what this person told me is a very successful real estate mogul, really, is you buy when you can afford it. You And what to Tom's point, when it's right for you. So if you try and time the market, you might never into the market enter the market and you might time yourself out. And, um, you know, when I bought my um, first property in 2013, someone told me I was overpaying. And, you know, today I have some people say that they're overpaying now. So you might always hear that, but if it's right for you personally, then don't be afraid about what's going on in the market. There are always deals to be had. Okay, so uh, let's talk about the process itself. 10 easy steps to be a homeowner. So the first thing you're going to want to do is have a conversation with a buyer's agent. And I know that sounds a little biased coming from me, but it is really important because the agent is one, going to be your advocate. And two, it's really your anchor contact throughout the process. You're going to be spending the most time with this person and they're going to be the referee with the other parties to make sure that everything is going smoothly and that you're keeping on track of your deadlines. A couple of things that are going to happen during that meeting that are very important. The first thing is that the agent must present to you what is called a Massachusetts mandatory disclosure. This is not a contract. It'll even say that underlined, although I do encourage you to sign a contract with this agent because you be mutually invested, but that's besides the point. This is an agency disclosure, and what it is is it disclose to you your rights as a consumer. In the state of Massachusetts, um, a real estate agent has a fiduciary responsibility to their clients, similar to that of a financial advisor and an attorney. And unfortunately, it's something that a lot of people don't realize. And at this first meeting, it is not only the law, and you don't even have to work with this person, but it is the law that this person explains it to you. Um, and it sets a, if you do work with them, it sets a precedence for your future interaction. So very important that happens. It's something that I take a lot of pride in um, is being a fiduciary for my clients. Also during that initial conversation, you want to talk about what you're looking for and why. And something um, that's very important is what is your holding time? What are your end goals? I always like to start with the end in mind with my clients. Are we eventually going to be in a Victorian mansion, and this is our one step along the way. Are we building a big real estate portfolio, living in one condo at a time? It's very important, especially in today's market, when we have such an increase in prices that I understand, or your agent understands your holding period, because it's going to I'm going to give you different advice if this is a forever home versus a five-year home. So that's really important. And we'll talk very generally about your budget, um, really what money you have to deploy for a down payment, um, what you have for closing costs, 
Closing costs are basically you're paying the bank to give you that large sum of money for your mortgage. And they're usually about one to 2% of the purchase price. Um, and we'll also look generally at what you want to spend per month. And we'll kind of back into it. And this is very, very high level just to give you an idea of what your buying power is in different towns. And often I'm introducing my clients to other towns that they didn't think of where they might have a little bit more buying power. The next thing you'll want to do and is connect with a mortgage professional. And you want to fill out an application, have them look at your credit, have them review your documents. You want to do basically a credit and a financial checkup almost. Even if you're a ways out, there's credit scoring is very complicated. And Things that seem very obvious um, are can actually negatively impact your credit. For example, credit companies want you to have debt. They want you to have a little bit of debt and show that you're paying it. And so some people think their credit is perfect because they have no debt. And in fact, they just don't have any credit. So it's important that you do those checkups. Now, one thing that might surprise you, as you're interviewing mortgage professionals, you really don't want that first conversation to be all about rate. And I'll tell you why. Rate is irrelevant to you until you have an offer accepted. It is a number that changes with the market every single day. It comes out at 11 o'clock and it, um, that rate is gone by the end of business that day. So if your conversation is solely based on rate, it's irrelevant for your time right now. You want to make sure that you are being conservative in your budgeting because we don't know what's going to happen to rates, just like we didn't know what was going to happen um, with rates last year. You know, coronavirus hit and rates plummeted. Um, unfortunately, global strife is great for mortgage rates, but it's not something we really want. Um, so you don't want it to be all about rate. You want it to be about, is this person responsive? Do they have my best interest in, in, uh, in mind? And also, do they have an underwriter and a processor at their fingertips? Um, you don't want to be in a situation where your file goes into a pool of 100 underwriters. And when we have our mortgage commitment, which we'll talk about in a minute, we can't get a hold of that per, of an individual to understand where we are. And then you have $50,000 on the line. So um, who you use as a lender is very important. Most of them can match rates if someone's a little better than the other. So focus on someone who's going to be able to get you to the finish line on, on time. So after meeting with the lender, um, then we get to Go and look at properties. And this is the fun part. This is my favorite part. Um, I always say make sure that you like your real estate agent as well, because we spend a lot of time together early Saturday mornings, um, Sunday mornings. So uh, it doesn't hurt if you enjoy them as well. And lots of adventures that happen. The craziest that happened to me recently was I had a client, we were selling their place in Jamaica Plain and they were moving to the suburbs. My transitional people out there, listen up, transitioning um, to Duxbury. And we're looking at this property and had been on the market. And um, as we're, we had really a lot of beautiful land. And as we're here, we see this man walk by and he has an ax and a saw. And so we're saying, oh, hi, we think it's a seller. He said, oh no, I'm not the seller. Um, my family has an easement to use this land in order to chop wood. So there was a wood chopping easement on this property. And they actually ended up buying it and it was fine, but it was really good that we found that out. So that's my craziest showing experience today. Um, so when we look at these properties, what we wanna do, a couple of best practices. First of all, if the listing agent is there, I encourage you to use my secret weapon, which is called the polite poker face, okay? We want to be actually selling ourselves to the listing agent as well as pleasant, reasonable people. And if you have any questions, go through your buyer's agent. Us real estate agents, we always have our antenna up. Everything that you say can and will be used against you in a negotiation. And you would be surprised by the way you frame questions, how that can be interpreted and then relayed to the seller. So there's a lot of analysis, maybe over analysis that sometimes goes into negotiation. So make sure that you use your buyer's agent to ask all the questions. And we're going to be looking at every nook and cranny while we're viewing the property, 
we are going to be using all of our senses, our sight, our smell, hearing, even touch. We're going to touch the cabinets to see what material they are, other things. Um, smell, we're smelling for mold and mildew. Um, so it's really important that we do as much due diligence as possible while we're looking at the property because we don't want any surprises to come up with the inspection. We also want to make sure that anything that needs to be done with the property, and there usually always is, um, is that you have this in mind as you're putting in the offer because you don't want a big surprise to happen and then all of a sudden, um, you know, you you lose the property or you're in over your head. So that showing period is very important and we're going to be looking at everything with a fine tooth comb. I'm going to be pointing things out about sewage, plumbing, electric, all of that, the foundation, and we're just keeping it close to the vest if the listing agent is there and we'll discuss everything afterwards. So we've looked at as much property as possible and uh, don't worry about viewing property. I always tell clients, um, some of them will be like, I feel bad taking you out. Never feel bad. One, it's fun for me. Two, and I'm sure every real estate agent feels that way. And two, you need to see as much property to make the to make this decision. You need context. So don't worry about that and always trust your gut throughout this process. Okay, so let's talk about the offer. What goes into the offer? Well, believe it or not, that Massachusetts mandatory agency disclosure goes in there, but you've forgotten about that by now. Um, then your pre-approval, not a pre-qualification. We do want it to be a pre-approval, which means that they've reviewed your documents and they've pulled your credit. A $1,000 check. This is an earnest money deposit, one of two that you'll make prior to closing. They go with each contract. So Massachusetts is a two contract state and it is your conveyance for your offer. It is what legally binds both parties together. And we have your um, the offer itself, which talks about timing and price and then the contingencies. Standard contingencies are inspection and finance. So let's say we get the offer accepted, a couple of things are going to happen simultaneously. So, and pretty quickly, first thing we want to do is get that check delivered. Sometimes it's electronic, depending on the company. Um, sometimes we're meeting in parking lots on the side of the road. You're dropping it off. I'm picking it up and dropping it off. We just want to make sure we're getting that check delivered with some urgency. We are connecting you to an attorney. So you'll want to have a real estate attorney, someone who specializes in real estate law. And of course, your real estate agent can introduce you to anyone um, and myself included. And this person, it's important they're a real estate attorney. They're going to be representing you during the next contract, which is the purchase and sale. And they're going to represent you at closing as well. And then we want to schedule our inspection. So all of these three things happen really quickly, basically all at once. We want to do the inspection as soon as possible so that if if anything comes up, we have time to do further due diligence. I usually recommend to clients, if you have a good relationship with your manager, to just give them a heads up. You're in the process of looking for a home. And if an offer is accepted, you might need to you know, sneak out for two hours at a time in order to make the inspection. I defer to, of course, you know, your, whatever is going on in your personal situation, but that's worked for some people. During the inspection, if anything comes up, um, then that we need to address, and really those are things, can I move into it with, with this being done? Or do, do, rather, let me say this in a different way. Does this need to be done so I can live here safely and move into it? Is it structural? Is it mechanical? Those are kind of our checks for the inspection. And if those things do come up, what we'll want to do, the inspector is the generalist. He looks at everything with a fine tooth comb. It's his job to pick on every little thing. And so let's say he opens up the electric panel and is worried about, you know, maybe too many wires in one circuit breaker. And then we bring in an electrician. And the electrician might say, actually, this is a, this isn't double tapped. This is supposed to be a double breaker and it's done appropriately. Or they might say, wow, you know, this is a fire hazard. We need to get this fixed. It's going to cost blank amount. Then we negotiate with the seller and say, okay, are you going to provide us a concession or are you going to do it yourself? And of course I lead with whatever the buyer's preference is. Negotiating on an inspection um, when it's a multiple offer situation is challenging because 
the person who has the most negotiating power is the person who has the most options. And if they have 20 other offers that they could go to, then that's where we are, that's where we have less negotiating power. And that's why it's so crucial that we try and figure out everything when we see the property as we're looking at it. So let's say, you know, we finish with the inspection, we negotiate terms successfully, all of that goes into the purchase and sale. Simultaneously, um, during this process, the attorney is reviewing language with you over the purchase and sale. And we sign the purchase and sale. And um, it's usually about 10, 15 page document. Your second deposit is due. This is up to 5% of the purchase price. So it's usually 5% minus $1,000. So in an escrow account, usually with the seller's attorney or the seller's agent's company, there is all of your deposits and it's not, neither party can access these deposits until you have closed. So if something happens with the inspection, you decide to walk away, you get that $1,000 back. The next big milestone in this process is your mortgage commitment date. And so that's three weeks after the purchase and sale. And if God forbid your circumstances change before, as long as we notify the other side before this date, you can get your 5% back. That's why it's so important to have a lender who is responsive and who has a processor and an underwriter, either a couple or their one of each or a couple of people that he has a direct line to so that we know what's going on because otherwise 5% of the purchase price, which is a lot of money is on the line. So don't worry. Um, I know I'm not, I'm not trying to scare anyone. We're, we can stay on top of this. I've never had an issue with it. Sometimes it's a moving target. We have to move it. We have to push it out and that's okay as long as we let the other party know in time. So just keep that in mind. I've never had my holy, an issue, especially with my Holy Cross people because everyone's all over it. So I always joke, you're hot and heavy with me up until we sign the purchase and sale. And then you're hot, hot and heavy with the lender and underwriting until the mortgage commitment date. So um, depending on when you're closing, and this can happen in as quickly as 30 days, um, make sure that's a great question as you're interviewing lenders to ask, make sure they can close in 30 days. 45 tends to be the average, 60 is a little bit longer. And then of course, everything's negotiable. So we could you know, push it way out there. The closest, um, the fastest you can close even with cash is usually about three weeks. And that's because of title search. Um, that usually that happens after the purchase and sale and can take about two weeks. So it can be done sooner. You just would have to go to the purchase and sale a lot faster. Um, so we've had our uh, mortgage commitment date. It's about a week before closing. That's when you get your final closing disclosure. You see what exactly your closing costs are, the money that needs to go into escrow, which the um, whoever is going to be processing your loan, they will pay your taxes. So um, that is, so there's an additional, there's a fee that goes to the, to the bank to pay for your mortgage. And then there's an, S, there's an additional money that goes into escrow to pay for your taxes. And all of that is gonna be on your closing disclosure, and um, basically a week of closing, that's when we're gonna schedule the closing time. It's usually in the morning. And I recommend that we do the final walk through the day of closing. And the reason for that is if we do it two days before, a day before, and something happens in that in-between time, we have no recourse. So I like to do it the day of, usually people have taken a half day off. So maybe we'll do the walkthrough at 9 a.m. There's daylight. Um, and we test all the appliances. That's usually the worst thing that will that can happen is maybe an appliance doesn't work and then you'll get a credit. But we walk through, we make sure that it's broom swept. And let me just warn you, that is very loosely interpreted by people. <laughs> I usually recommend my sellers as a courtesy, get it professionally cleaned. Um, but some people, I guess, you know, close their eyes and just swirl a broom around and, you know, call it a day. So Brace yourself for that. Everyone has a different parameter for clean. Um, so we do the final walkthrough and then you sit down to closing, you sign paperwork for almost 45 minutes. The deed 
then goes to the registry of deeds. It gets recorded officially in the registry of deeds at whatever county you're buying in. And once that is officially recorded, sometimes depending on where it is in the queue, um, sometimes it takes a few hours, you, you know, you get your keys then and you own the home. So, you know, maybe if we close at 10 by one o'clock, you will be able to access your home. So just that simple guys. Before I go into questions, I want to talk about offer strategy. So this is um, the big thing. And there's so many different things we can do with offer strategy. There's so many ways that we can be creative with this. I wanna just talk about what the mechanics of the offer are so that you have an understanding of the different levers we can pull in order to make ourselves competitive. So right now there's really two types of situations. We're either in a multiple offer situation or it's a traditional, you know, maybe the, the property has been on the market for two weeks or longer, and that's where we have a little bit more negotiating power. So let's talk about price in a multiple offer situation. As I mentioned, we're in a rising market. So again, there's a number of things that we do, but when there's an expectation that we are going over asking in order to get the property, we'll use the data to guide us in making a decision. And if the data is lagging behind what I know is going on in the market, we're gonna discuss that. And often we'll use um, what I have been using recently as an escalation clause. So let's say um, I just had this happen actually in Stoneham. Um, the property was listed for 800. Comparables showed that you could justify going up as high as 900. And what my talking to my clients, we talked about you know going in maybe at 850 with an escalation, and they chose 885 because that was their number. So there's the market number, but what's important for you is it's your number and it's your budget and what the house is worth to you. So I provide the market data and you decide on your own personal value. So we decided to go up to 885 in an escalation clause. Um, so we went 5,000 over every other offer up until 885. In this current market, I like using an escalation clause because it allows us to participate competitively while protecting your capital. Two years ago, I hated an escalation clause because we were showing our hand. So with different market styles, different environments, what's going on with the property, we do different things. Let's talk about timing. So um, being flexible with timing can really help. Some sellers who choose to sell first and then buy will need more time. Um, if you can be flexible with timing, that helps. If we can go quickly with timing, that helps too. So making sure you have a lender who can close in 30 days. Um, you know, if you have that cash option closing in three weeks, going to the purchase and sale in less than a week, that can be incredibly powerful. It means we need to hustle, but um, I'm in it if, you know, my clients are in it. So um, lots of great ways that we, lots of creative things we can do with timing. And then terms. So talking about terms, most terms are your financing and your inspection, although um, I have had other creative terms. Last year, I had an Oscar the dog clause <laughs> contingency, I should say, an Oscar contingency. Um, my clients had a big, lovable 135-pound dog, and most uh, condos in Cambridge where they're looking in, you know, they had a weight limit of 25 or under. So we had to have an Oscar contingency and they did get it accepted with that. So, um, but we'll just talk about the standard one. So first off, there's financing. I do not recommend waiving a financing contingency unless you truly have cash to back you up. That is an incredible amount of risk to take on. I have had clients who do have the cash but want to get financing, waive financing. And I've had clients whose parents are willing to back them up with cash, waive financing to be competitive. But you have to understand when you waive financing and you don't get your loan, you need to execute on cash. And that was a calculated risk they were willing to take, but that's not the case for everyone. So the other um, issue with financing is, and waiving that, is that you don't have any wiggle room with your appraisal. The property doesn't appraise. You are not able to negotiate on that. So 
Um, we do have some people who are having financing and waiving their appraisal negotiations or adding a dollar amount on their appraisal negotiations. Again, that can be a powerful move, but is it a calculated risk you're willing to take? Is this your forever home? Maybe that is something you're willing to take then. You know, you're, um, you're going to be here for the rest of your life. So if you are, if it doesn't appraise, you know, it's going to appraise in six months or 10 years. And that is more than likely going to be the case in this rising market market, especially that six months mark or even, you know, two months mark, but usually can't refinance that quickly. But so that's another thing we're seeing in terms of terms. Um, the other and the big one is inspection. I know a lot of you asked about that. So again, um, do not waive an inspection unless you feel comfortable doing that. No property is worth something that makes you feel uncomfortable. And we might have to kiss a lot of toads. We might not get the properties that have 50 offers on them, but that's okay. Um, you need to be able to, real estate is about taking calculated risks and you have to decide what your risk, what, what your risk level is. So here are a couple things we can do with the, with the inspection to be creative and still have one. You can, um, every inspection using the Greater Boston real estate um, contract documents has a dollar amount to it. And what that dollar amount means is that you can walk away if damages exceed that number. So you could have that number be zero. That would be the most conservative. You could have that number be 10,000. That would show you have a little bit more skin in the game for the seller. You can also add additional language that says, you know, I have an inspection contingency, I want the ability to walk away, but if I'm moving forward, then I'm not negotiating anything. I'm not asking for a price decrease. I'm not asking for the seller to do anything. And that's helped get the helped in a competitive situation or in a situation where we're going really low on price, you know, like, well, we're not gonna make you do anything else. So it's kind of an example of pushing the lever in different ways. You can also do an informational inspection. This means that you don't have a contingency. You are going to lose $1,000 if you decide that you wanna walk away because of something we didn't anticipate with the inspection. Now, some people, when the house has been, you know, most of the guts of the house have been recently done, the roof is new, they're willing to take on that risk and say, well, I'd, I'd rather, the house is worth it to me for this, and um, I'm okay with losing $1,000. So that's another option you can do. We can also, depending on timing, try to do an inspection prior to submitting an offer. And these are all really strategies you use in a multiple offer situation. If we're not in a multiple offer situation, that's where we can be more creative. And maybe we pull one lever. And then when they come back to us, we pull the next lever. And then when they come back to us a third time, that's when we go with the final lever. So um, it's in these multiple offer situations where we're pulling out all the stops because we're noticing that there's not another round. It's getting um, finalized after the first submission of offers. Um, so before I open it up to questions, I do just want to part with a little bit of advice. Um, first of all, be open to properties that didn't sell right away. Sometimes that means that they were mispriced. Sometimes the marketing materials just aren't great. Maybe they're not professional photos. Maybe it's not staged. Um, or maybe it needs a little bit of renovation. Maybe it needs a little bit of paint. Try to have an open mind because properties that didn't sell is where you're going to have more negotiating power. I would also encourage you to be flexible. If you can be flexible with your timing, that can really help in this market. And then finally, have conviction in whatever you do. We start with the end and just tell yourself, is this house worth it to me? And sometimes maybe it will be, and sometimes it's not. But as long as you act with conviction, then you're going to have no regrets throughout this process. And I promise you that you will find something. Everyone always finds something. It might be a little discouraging with the low inventory. We might kiss a few toads and not get offers accepted, but the one you end up with is truly the one that's meant to be. And I cannot tell you how many times that's happened with my clients. We've, they've been devastated over offers they haven't gotten accepted. And then the one they ended up with was less expensive, bigger, and had all their must-haves. And I'm it's amazing. It's uncanny how much that happens. So Tom, I guess with that, let's see if we have any questions. I'll stop our screen share here. Absolutely. Allie, thank you. That was 
that was wonderful. It was a nice overview. You touched on a lot of things and good, um, I'm glad. You know, based on based on the uh, the questions that have been submitted, you really you really hit on some some key oh, okay. points that people want to dive a little bit deeper in. So so okay. thank you for that. Um, and and I just want to remind all of you if you've got questions, keep them coming because we're going to spend the next 20 minutes or so um, answering what's on your mind. Um, Ali, one, one question, um, kind of a series of questions that came in, especially for first time home buyers um, is, you know, you, you recommended, you know, find a buyer agent first. That should be like step, step number one. Um, and, you know, as, as, as people are kind of wading into that, um, is there advice that you can offer about kind of where to go in that direction? I mean, you know, you've got great experience, you've got great advice, but you know, as someone is wading into that, how do they find a buyer? Like that's a question that's on people's minds. How do they find a buyer's agent? Correct, yes. Oh, okay, got it. Well, um, you know, you can always ask friends and family for referrals. Um, you can certainly try and do your research based on reviews. Um, you know, you can, am I allowed to say they can reach out to me? Absolutely. <laughs> sure. You can reach out to me. I mean, I would say what you want is that to make sure you have a good fit with this person because you're spending a lot of time with them. You need to feel that you trust them. That is so important because they are helping you navigate this massively important decision where there's a lot of money on the line. So you need to feel that trust and you need to know that they have credibility and, and experience. So I would say, um, you know, uh, there's, a, everyone knows a real estate agent, right? That's, um, but you can always start with a couple of different friends and family. And then of course, I'm always helpful to, I, I'm always happy to have that initial conversation. And then if it's, you know, not a good fit. I can always guide people other way. So do, your, other do, your do your do your do your research. research. Yeah, and think yeah. of it as yeah. you know, don't just go. Maybe if the first person you meet is a great fit, awesome. But uh, you want to make sure that uh, if they're not, that you kind of keep experiencing interviewing other people and then settle on someone mm -hmm. and have a vested interest in each other so that you're going to get the most out of the experience. Here's an interesting question, Ali. On average, you know, obviously things can ebb and flow, but on average, how long does it take someone to find a house from their initial conversation with an agent until, you know, they're, they, they get the keys? Um, I would say um, it really depends. It does depend. I know uh, I would say on average, it's about six months. With that said, I've had people reach out to me two years before and we worked together for two years. And I've had people who found something in two months because we've, I have had a few, some people just know what they want. Most people need to see a lot of property, but some people know what they want and they found it immediately on our first showing. And then we closed in 30 days. So um, average is six months, but it can be as fast as two months or as long as many years. And probably luck also plays a big factor. Yes, that does, totally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can you, and I know you, you talked about it, but can you explain the down payment process and what a reasonable percentage should be or in your experience, can you, can you kind of walk us through that a little bit more? Definitely. So, um, you don't need, you can put as little as three and a half percent down if you qualify for what is called an FHA loan. That's really a more lender specific question. Um, most people are putting, um, I would say five, 10 or 20% down. When you engage with a lender, there are certain levels where like, for example, you get a better rate if you're putting 10% down versus five. But you're, if you're putting 15% down, it's not that much better than 10%. Um, I will, right now, a lot of people are putting 20% down. Um, and to be honest, I am not sure why, because mortgage insurance isn't that high, but just so happens most people um, seem to be putting 20% down. What is um, unfortunate, but is a reality, is that as 
when you're in a multiple offer situation, if you have less than 20% down, the listing agent does prefer to see having 20% down. So it, it is a deterrent in a multiple offer situation because they want to make the assumption that if it doesn't appraise, you can restructure your loan. Now, every property I have bought personally, except for my investment properties, I have put less than 20% down. So it is absolutely doable um, and you need to honor your own budget and we just work through those um, requirements. So um, I would say when you're thinking about your down payment, you want to consider what you want in a home and um, you know, your buying power in the particular areas, the cash you have at hand, what you wanna spend monthly because all of that impacts monthly and then um, also you wanna have some extra money for your closing costs. So usually it's about 1.5%. I, I tell people to plan for about three, or sorry, about 2% of the purchase price. So if you're buying an $800,000 home, make sure you have an extra 16,000 for closing costs. Okay, and, and I was gonna, that was gonna be my next question. Okay. We've heard from a few people, especially first time home buyers, and you've got the down payment, you've got yep. the closing costs. Are there other, potential like hidden expenses that you find that some clients don't really think of or isn't really on their radar until they come front and center as people are starting to work through a budget um, in this process? That's a great question. Um, wouldn't say hidden expenses, but things that don't hit people's radar. More so like yeah, yeah. yes. Um, when I talk about closing costs, I'm talking about your attorney fees, which is a flat fee. Um, your title insurance is in there. And then there's the bank fees as well. So, um, oh, excuse me, the bank fees and then your escrow, which is your taxes. So all of that goes into closing costs. So I know sometimes um, clients will see the closing disclosure and they won't have realized that it is compiled of those different line items. The other thing that has been an issue is, especially if we're looking in different towns, is as you are maybe running your own analysis using a mortgage calculator, make sure you're adding taxes. Um, because a lot of people will forget to add taxes or they won't realize, you know, oh, you know, $700,000 home in Dedham versus a 700,000 home in Milton are actually gonna have a very different monthly payment because of the difference in taxes. So keep that in mind. And um, let me think, I had one more that can be a hidden cost. Your condo fees, remember that you're now paying for water and sewer if you own a home. You're gonna have ins uh, monthly insurance. I usually recommend adding about $100 to that. That seems to be overly conservative. So more so in the monthly payments, I would say that people get surprised. Okay. Um... And and you know you talked about the the market right now and how it's 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 going well. I mean it's 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 a hot market, um, and it's like some properties have been going above above their prices. Have you and a few people have asked this? Have you seen issues with homes appraising because of the 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 cost going above? Um, you know, say market value or or so on and so forth. That we've had a few people ask that. Have you seen issues with with appraising as a result? That's a great question. And what's very interesting is I saw more issues with appraisals last year and the year before than this year. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's because the appraisers are taking into account the low inventory and high demand. And so when there's a multiple offer situation, and I know this from being a listing agent as well, you notify the appraiser of that and you show them all the different offers. And so they see that, okay, um, this has, this, this is truly justified. If you don't, if you do have an issue with an appraisal, um, or the other thing, let me just add really very quickly is that as I, when I advise clients on making offers over asking, they are driven in data and experience. And so the idea is to not have a property not appraised. And so for example, um, the property I mentioned in Stoneham, 
which I recommended. I said you could go up to 100,000 over, which, un believe it or not, is um, on average, we're seeing properties go that high over asking. Um, it actually exceeded 900,000, and we didn't get that property, we didn't get that offer accepted. Now, in that case, my clients and I, we feel conviction. We're like, that's okay. We didn't, my number was nine, their number was 885, and we feel conviction in that. So, yes, um, there is a concern. It hasn't not knock on wood, it hasn't happened this year for me because we've been so careful with it. Um, and, and because of the high demand, low inventory, whereas last year, I think the appraisers were a lot more nervous because of all the uncertainty. And as we're coming out of COVID, um, it, it doesn't seem to be an issue. So I know that was, I hope that helped answer the question. Here's an interesting one. I mean, you, you set out a really good kind of timetable and different steps. Does the process change at all when buying new construction? Are there, are there added steps or different steps if you're looking at new, new construction? That's a great question. Yes, it does. So it depends what phase you're buying in. Um, if it is a new subdivision, then often there's like a model home and it could be a year out before that property is done. And you'll even get allowances where you are up. Oh, you can hear the thunder going now. Um, we'll actually get allowances um, for, for example, your tile, you're allowed $10,000 in tile and kill the contractor and the developer will have a certain options you can choose from and you can choose to upgrade. So that can be a much longer process when you buy new construction and that is already built. Um, it can be about the same. What we do add to that is you get a builder's warranty, which is nice. And now in Massachusetts, if it was a studs to the studs renovation, meaning they didn't flatten the home, but they went to the studs where you would just see the framing, you get a partial builder's warranty on that. So um, in those cases, sometimes clients don't end up doing a um, home inspection because they have what's called a certificate of occupancy, which means that that town's building inspector who has a higher standard than a home inspector who just does general inspection because this the building inspector is looking at code um it, you the certificate of occupancy shows that it's to that building inspector standard the other thing that we will do um, with all new construction is a punch list so meaning that before like let's say two weeks maybe before the final, final walkthrough, we'll have a walkthrough and say, touch this paint up, touch this up, you know, this needs to be fixed. And we'll go through and make sure every little thing is taken care of. And then the week of, and then the day of closing, we'll go again and make sure that was done. Mm -hmm. So are a couple more steps for that. Okay. Um, we have a question here and I don't know if you, you, you're able to, to talk about it. Um, could you explain um, PMI, private mortgage insurance, and what is that? How does that play a factor? Um, we've got a couple people ask that question. PMI, private mortgage insurance. That's a great question. So typically you're going to be paying PMI when you put less than 20% down. So some people prefer only putting 20% down because you don't have this extra monthly payment, which is the private mortgage insurance, and your rates tend to be a little bit better. But what I say is that you buy a property based on whatever you can afford for your down payment, if that monthly payment works for you, because cash is king and you want to have more to deploy depending on what your situation is. So private mortgage insurance is an additional cost that you have to get when you are not putting 20% down. Basically, you, it's an additional, it's, base, it's, it's insurance for your loan and you're paying it for the bank. So the bank makes you pay for their insurance, aren't they? Nice. Um, and it's not as expensive as it was um, years ago. It is actually pretty inexpensive. It's I when I'm working with a client, I usually budget. They're putting 10% down, like around 120. You really do need to get that number from your lender. But if it's 
the difference between an extra hundred grand to put down that you would need to get to 20% or 100, 150 on your monthly payment, often people will take the extra monthly payment to keep that, you know, um, to keep, to either hold on to those assets or to be able to buy at all because it's 20% is quite a bit of uh, down payment. Mm -hmm. Um, here, here's an interesting question. We've heard this in, in a few different iterations from, from folks um, today is, do you have advice for clients who come to you who are looking to buy and sell? And both of those are kind of up in the air. Like you don't know what's going to come first. Um, so, you know, we, we've had a few like specific questions is, you know, someone's already sold their house. They're looking um, you know, possibly renting in the short period before mm. buying, like, could, could you just, I don't know, offer some tidbits or advice that you have from clients that you worked with who've been in that boat, buying and selling, and you're just kind of going off and hoping. Right, exactly. Um, so, um, well, congratulations to the people who are doing that, because that's an exciting time. You usually, um, you know, buying your next home or your forever home. Um, so yes, this is the chicken or the egg. Do we buy first or do we sell first? There are pros and cons to both. Um, I, most people I work with choose, it, it depends on a lot of things, but most people who are buying their second home and selling their starter home will sell or will buy first and then sell. For my clients who are selling a luxury home and then buying, will sell first and then buy. And it all has to do with how long will it take your home to sell? And of course, this isn't something we can guarantee, but we use data to make that determination. And the pros of selling first is that you have your capital to deploy. The con is that you can negotiate a longer term to closing term to find the property, but you can only get so much time and that does put a lot of pressure on you to find something. But people do, you know, when there's a will, there's a way, people have done it. Um, the other side is when you buy first, you have to, you know, you have more, you have all the time in the world to find a place, right? But when you sell, you have to sell whenever you find the place that could be in the dead of winter. Um, and you really uh, are not having a contingency on your home purchase to sell. So you need to feel comfortable that that home is gonna sell and it's going to, and you're gonna be aggressive to make sure that it does so. One thing to bear in mind as you're navigating this is that when you pay your mortgage for the first time, you pay your, or, or really you always pay your mortgage in arrears, but when you pay your first mortgage, what that means and looks like is that you pay two calendar months after you close. So we could close May 1 or May 31st. And no matter what, we're not paying our first mortgage until July 1. So if you choose to, to buy first, Let's say you buy, um, you put an offer in May 1, closing is July, and um, then you sell your other property. So you close in July, you're not going to pay your mortgage until, until September. So you actually have four months to sell. Gotcha. Okay. And so it's more time than you think. Um, what I recommend is that the clients... Um, you know, make sure that if they are buying first, that they get all of their pictures and marketing material done ahead of time so that the second it is we're ready, we can list immediately. Um, so pros and cons to both for the person who sold first, probably I would, um, you know, feel out like a short term rental just so you don't put pressure on yourself. You don't want to be making a decision this huge um, under a time constraint. So do the best that you can now. This is the advice I'd give my own clients. Do the best you can now and have a D-Day where if if I'm not finding something, I'm looking at rentals and maybe you, you know, rent in, if you can work from virtually, maybe you rent down the Cape or something for two months or make it kind of fun or. All right. 
Yeah, well, we have time for maybe just a couple more okay. questions. One is, and, and um, are you aware of any government programs for first time home buyers or any kind of an, an incentive programs for people looking to buy their first place? Do they exist? Uh, they don't. Um, it did exist with Obama okay. many years ago. And I think 2012, it might have ended. So no, but owner occupying, you do get a good rate. Okay. And, and really the last one, and, and this this has been a common theme, especially amongst first time home buyers. You know, you, you see a brand new client, they're looking to buy their first place. What advice would you give them as they're as they're starting this process? Should they be, you know, searching on the web? Should they be saving money? Like what what is the advice for someone that is looking to really enter these waters for the first time? I would say all of the above. Mm -hmm. um, get you cannot start too soon. You can't start educating yourself on the market too soon. So um, empower yourself. Going to one of these type of seminars is great. So you have a little bit of knowledge. Get connected. Get your team going, even if it's a year out, two years out, so that you have someone who you're you have, you're educated, you have people who are working for you and you're ready to go. And I think, you know, I mentioned this early, but, um, earlier, but just to beat a dead horse, focus on the end and have conviction. You know, what is your end goal? Is this your starter home? Are you going to raise your family here? Is this going to be the start of your real estate empire? Um, but just focus on the end and have conviction throughout the process. Stick to that, stick to your guns because there will be ups and downs. But as long as you have conviction in every decision that you make, you'll have no regrets, you'll have no buyer's remorse and you'll end up with the perfect place for you. Good advice. Well, Allie, thank you so much for sharing your time and your knowledge with us today. Um, this was wonderful, it really was. And we hope to continue offering more of these Holy Cross webinars um, throughout the coming months. So stay tuned for upcoming notices about future dates and topics. And in the meantime, Allie, thank you and everyone else. Thanks for joining us and have a great evening. Awesome, thank you everyone.